And this is what I'm gonna cover today. I just thought it would be good to summarize it and put it in, in a way, in a format, if you wanna just pin it up on the refrigerator and just keep making these declarations. That's what I find very helpful, just to keep reminding myself. It's a, number one says, as you take the gospel from the church to the streets, remember that the waves and winds still know his name. So one of my goals for 2021 is not to just be doing this in church, but to also be doing it outside in the streets. And when Sean Foyt started doing those worship protests all over the country, right? The church has left the building. <laughs> we were always supposed to do this, right? We were always supposed to be out talking to people about the Lord, but never has it been more important than right now. Regardless of the waves and winds, we're gonna still press on. And we're gonna say to that storm, peace be still. It's amazing when you carry peace that you can transfer that peace into the room, into an atmosphere where there's tension. You carry a peace you bring and you walk in with that peace. And then it says, sort out the chaos and unfinished business all around you by completing your God-given assignments. This is a direction that Paul gave to Titus. He said, I left you in Crete in order that you may sort out the chaos and unfinished business. And that's the duty of the church in this world, always, to sort out the chaos. Because the world keeps drifting to some different kind of tune than the tune of the Lord. It's so seductive to drift away from righteousness. And the Lord said, no, you, the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. You will be the standard bearers. The church is gonna be the one to sort out all the craziness that's going on in the culture, more by our example than by our preaching. That people would look at us and say, there's something different about you. You're not moved by the same forces that the rest of the people I know are. What's different about you? And you can say, I put my trust in Jesus. I read the Bible, I study the word, I pray, I ask the Lord to help me about everything. And he does, and he shows himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is strong and loyal towards him. How many got a witness for this, doesn't he? When you ask for help, he's there, he's a very present help. Prayerlessness is when we don't ask, and that's a sin. No, I'm gonna help be a Christian that sorts out the chaos and the unfinished business all around me, and I'm gonna know my assignments and I'm gonna complete them. And then I said, do not fail the character test. Strengthen yourself in the Lord and keep your eyes on the prize of your high calling. Right? I'm going to press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that, that the Lord has given me. Each one of us has a different call. As I look around the room, I see so many different talents and, and gifts represented here. Oh, you really do you have to stop? Oh, man, I'm sorry, I was just really enjoying that. Part of my pull is coming back here. So, um, don't we love Danny? Don't be mean to him in the parking lot, all right? I don't want him leaving over any reason. I make it hard enough for him to stay. But uh, he's still here. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the character test is something that we take on a regular basis, right? The, the affairs of life, if we were honest, I think we could look back at, at the end of a day and say there were certain things we did that weren't completely 100% lined up with how God would want us to do it, right? And that's why he says, I'm close to those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. I want you to be the kind of people who are teachable. That's the word Trisha used earlier. Teachable means that, like Paul said, I, I'm not aware of anything that I've done wrong, but that doesn't make me, uh, that doesn't, that's not an excuse just because I'm not aware. I'm still going to be open to what the Lord wants to show me. And, and when it says about David that when his men wanted to kill him, because of the, the raid on Ziklag, he strengthened himself in the Lord. So God doesn't shame us when we only get a B instead of the A that we wanted, or if we get a C or a D, you know, to think about school's grading process. He still loves you. Even if you didn't make the mark that you wanted to make, he still loves you, just like you love your children. And you want them to keep on learning from each situation. A good coach in sports, helps his team understand how to take things away, even from a loss. Good attorneys will tell you they learn more on the cases that they lost than on the cases that they won. It's, nobody gets to go all the way through this without ever having to experience that, right? That's part of our fallen nature. But the Lord wants to keep redeeming us. 
and transforming us into his image with ever increasing glory. You'll never, hopefully, I hope you never get tired of hearing me say that because I feel that is the cornerstone mission of our church is to help people be transformed into the image of Jesus with ever increasing glory. It never ends. That's from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It's in the NIV version. Some other versions say we go from glory to glory, right? Not a contradiction. Being transformed into the image of Christ with ever increasing glory. And then the last one says God is still on the throne and the gates of hell stand no chance against the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm saying it that way because the emphasis when Jesus said it was the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That's red letters if you got a red letter Bible. He said that about his church. And please help us. If you ever think that we're not being his church, I'm giving you permission. It's on video. You can watch it on the internet. If you think there's something that we're doing that doesn't line up with the word, let us know. Because I don't want anything to hinder our prayers. Even this little outreach that we did for Christmas, that's part of his church. We're not asking them to, to acknowledge who gave it to them. It's not about that. It's about the kingdom. And it's about being Christ's people in the earth and reflecting that. And then the opportunities that will come our way are, you just can't even count them all. So you're ready to launch into some Bible verses? I hope so. I did want you to see, can we back up to the picture of the sisters? Yeah. So I was here Tuesday night when, when the deaconry had their little service uh, for uh, the folks that live on the campus here. There's a lot of people that live here year round. And these are the, 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 they're not nuns, they're sisters. They don't want to be called nuns. They're sisters who've dedicated their life to the Lord. They're missionaries. And this organization that owns this property started in Germany, sent them here in the early 1900s. This building was built in 1939. Uh, I don't know which of the ones, I think it's the one in the middle with the blue shirt has been here over 60 years. She's 95 years old. Five of those seven people are over 90. So you talk about the blessing of the Lord, right? When you just dedicate your life to Him. It's amazing, isn't it? They need help, right? They need our prayers. This is their house. And they agreed to let us come in and, and upgrade the house, but still their house. They didn't have to agree to any of this, right? So, wow. Talk about honor your mother and father. They're not our mother and father, but they are saints in the Lord that have dedicated their lives to the Lord. And, and the Lord has blessed them. This is 45 acres of land right here that is part of their ministry, right? So if any of you have it on your heart to want to help them, it's really just kind of primary care kind of help. And, and there's you have to meet some standards that they give. You know, I'm not going to go into a long explanation of that. Just let me know, okay? We have... Uh, info at kingofkingswc.com just say I'd like to learn more about that and then I can uh, give you more information. The point though is pray for them okay because that's honor that is due. They have labored in the word their whole lives they've been missionaries since their teenage years they devoted their lives to the Lord. And you might say well why do they wear that clothes or whatever it's not the point okay it's not the point they're sold out for Jesus. And I want to be on that side of the people who are burning hearts for Jesus. So, Lord, we just bless these sisters that are here. We bless the board of the deaconry. We thank you for their dedication, for their commitment, for just the excellence this building brings that, that shows what they were willing to do for you. And, Lord, we just say, you have already blessed them with a long life, but let it even be rich in ministry. Let the latter days be greater than the former days in their lives, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the waves and winds still know his name. That's from Mark chapter 4, verse 39. And I love the way he said it, peace, be still. So when you feel like you're getting hijacked emotionally, that's what you say. Peace, be still. You know what, Phil, are you up there? Can't see it too good. Did you get the clip, that little video clip? You're gonna, you ready to go? All right, so this is something I experienced remember exactly when I think it was earlier this year but recently I was at the Jersey Shore and I experienced a squall maybe like you would say a supercell of a storm just kind of hit and I just wanted to show that and see if we can uh, give you a feeling of what I was feeling that day
I have a feeling that's what it was like when the apostles were out on the boat. You know, I've been down at that shore house my whole life. My parents had it since before I was born and uh, never experienced anything like that. It was just like we were right where the supercell was, was landing and it's, a, it's kind of a feeling of helplessness. Like it's such a big, strong, powerful thing that you're, that you're in that you're just grateful that you're inside the house. And you know, when you're on the water all the time, like fishermen would be, you know the signs and you try to predict it. And if you've ever been out on the water far from the dock where you have to land again, and you start to see something like that, it came really quick. I'm telling you, 10 minutes from not a blue sky, it was cloudy. And if you looked west, you could see how dark it was, but it moved really fast. So when you get caught out on the water, you, that's what they thought, they were gonna die. And what does Jesus do? He gets up. He awoke, he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So I just wanted you to feel that, what I felt that day, and even in the midst of that, Jesus says, peace, be still. That's the God you serve. If he's resident, and if, and if you're willing to yield to him, because he said, why were you afraid? We know that he rebuked the apostles, right? Why were you afraid? Part of it is because they were fishermen. <laughs> and they knew what it was like to be out on the water. But listen, the waves and wind still know his name. No matter what's going on in the culture, no matter how crazy things are getting, and I think they're getting very crazy, right? I mean, it's pretty hard not to think that about America when we were so grounded and rooted in traditional Judeo-Christian values in the Constitution, in the early writings of all the people that came here and founded the country. You can't deny it. The Bible's everywhere. And yet people are saying, no, we don't need that anymore. And we're saying, yes, you do. <laughs> we don't ever want to change that, right? And no Christian that served the Lord ever backed down from a fight, right? They're used to that. They understand that we're going to bring a word that people don't like to hear. Jesus said they're going to hate you. Not everybody, but the ones that want to be given to sin and lawlessness aren't going to like you saying there's a better way. Because, like, who are you to tell me, right? Get off my back. You have no authority to, to tell me how I should live my life. It's like, no, I'm not. I agree with you. I don't have authority to tell you how you live your life, but if you're asking me, I believe marriage means a man and a woman, as an example. <laughs> Let's not get too radical, right? Like, that's a pretty foundational part of the Bible. That's a covenant. It starts with a man and a woman in the garden. It ends at, at a wedding feast in Revelation. All throughout, we're called a family. So if the enemy wanted to attack the foundations of America, let's go after the family unit. Well, we're aware of the enemy's devices. I'm not going to roll over just because I don't want people to not like me as long as I know that I'm here in the Lord and I'm standing on his word. I have to find a way to convey that message in a way that shows that I love them too. And that I don't think I'm better than them because you have to deliver the truth to people, but you do it in love. It's probably the most supernatural part of following Jesus. We um, have been studying the Sermon on the Mount in the men's group for the last couple of weeks, and we're going to keep doing that. And I would encourage you to read it straight through from Matthew 5, verse 1, all the way to the end of chapter 7. Read it like one big sermon, because it is that. We believe it is that. And when you do that, like some of the comments I was getting back from the guys was, wow, I don't think I've ever done that before. I don't, ever, I don't think I ever just read those three chapters front to back. I've, I knew a lot of the pieces that were in there, right? We all know the Beatitudes. It starts out with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Right? We, we're familiar with those. Lots of them in there. But to read it together helps you get a different perspective. And that's what I'm hoping to do today about our mandate for the year ahead. I, I didn't have you stand to read that text verse, but let's just say it out loud together. Ready? Mark 4, 39. He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. All right, so let's go on this little tour of the Bible to get through those five points that, that I was making for you and to translate it into 
how we're supposed to live our lives Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way through. Yes, it's great to come to church. I think this is the most people I've seen in this building since we started having indoor services, so I'm really happy about that. I love hearing you all sing together and worship together, and it won't be forever that we have to wear these masks and that we can have a full house again and start bringing in guest speakers and conferences and all the things that we were doing. And we just have to look at this time that we've had as a way for God to show us what he wanted to show us. And wherever we were leaning on a counterfeit structure and putting too much trust in that thing, whatever could be shaken was shaken for a lot of us in the last nine months. That's okay. We can learn from that. We can come away. Just like fasting can help you learn what's really important and what, where I was just misguided and putting too much importance on certain things, right? So then from there, if we just unpack it a little more, uh, Luke 8, uh, we read from Mark, but now Luke 8, 22 says, he said to them, prior to that storm scene, they were on the land, he says to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake, right? And I'm curious, how many have ever heard a sermon on this preached? Lots of hands going up, right? And probably, I'm guessing, which I would agree with, what the minister was saying is, that's one of the reasons he said, why are you afraid? Don't you remember? I said we were going to cross over to the other side. Right? So if I said it, you can believe it. And that's a real indication of his relationship with the Lord, that he, his father, that he was sleeping in the midst of that. That's what faith lets you do. Right? Wow. Awesome. Again, it's not condemning if, they're, if they are afraid, but that's part of what we need to remember from this. He said we're crossing to the other side. You can trust his word. If he said it, I believe it. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. And we know what he said. He stood up. We already read that. He rebukes the wind. He rebukes the sea, and it stops, and it gets calm. The anointing breaks the yoke, right? He carried that anointing with him. And it's not a matter of our stature in the Lord because we know more Bible verses it's our relationship with Jesus that allows us to carry the anointing. And if we're completely sold out to him, and if we continue to encourage ourselves in the Lord, and we study to show ourselves approved, and if we stay connected with other believers, the chance of him downloading information to us increases dramatically. Then what we do with it matters. Are we willing to use what he gives us, or are we going to be like the one who hid the talent in the ground? Right? That talent got taken from that man and was given to the one who would use it. Because we're only here for a short time on this earth. And we have to understand that for the assignment that I have, I better get going. Because it, my, my window is going to close at some point. That I don't know when, that's, when that is. But I want to live with an urgency that what God has given me to do is really important to me. And I'm not saying be a workaholic. I'm saying... Be tuned into what the Lord is saying and be effective in what he's giving you to do. And we want to help you do that. So this is a verse I alluded to, uh, Titus 1, verses 4 and 5. It says, to you, Titus, Paul speaking, my dear son, birth through our shared faith, sort out the chaos and unfinished business. And that was in Crete that he left him there. It's a really good word, okay? This is the order that the Bible and the Word of God and Holy Spirit and the Trinity really brings to daily life. How many felt that when you first got saved? Like, finally, somebody's telling me how I'm supposed to live. And it's a life-giving way to live. It's not leading to destruction and hurting other people. It's leading me to a healthy life. Nobody else but me? Man, I can remember the month after I got saved, I had so much more money in my pocket. And it wasn't because I was making more. I just wasn't wasting it in the bars, buying rounds of drinks for people. It's like the money was having babies in my wallet. No, you just weren't drunk half your life and acted stupid. We had a guy in the church early. He used to call it devil juice. <laughs> and I have to say, yes, man, I agree. I, for me, it was. I know, I understand people could still have a glass of wine. But um, if I don't have the first one, I can't have the 15th one, right? So I just chose that, that path, kept it simple. <laughs> and then he said, as you bring, sort out the chaos and the unfinished business, then appoint elders over the communities in each and every city according to my earlier orders. Right? So Paul well, is credited, rightly so, with birthing many of the early churches. In the book of Acts, we read about it. And, and then the letters, we read about how he's communicating with his leaders 
And it's really not that different than what Jethro said to Moses. Remember back in the Old Testament? And Jethro was Moses' father-in-law, and he said, it's not good what you're doing. Remember this? Not at me, because I can't see your faces too good with, with your mask on. Yeah, yeah, like, Moses, you're going to burn out. You're going to have to raise up some leaders, and you're going to have to spread the work out. And then, you know, you set, set up in groups, and then as something is really hard, you bring those to me. But you guys handle the people so that I can keep hearing from God so that we keep following the cloud. Cloud by day, fire by night, right? The cloud keeps you protected from the sun during the day. The fire keeps you warm from the cold at night. And you don't want to be in a church where the leaders aren't hearing from God. I sure don't. You marry a prophet. You got your hands full in a good way. It's really important that you can be iron sharpening iron and that you can let other people be sharpening you. And it's not really politically correct today, but I don't care if somebody has to tell you, because I love you, I need to tell you you're going in the wrong direction. That is love. Just telling them to do whatever they want is not love. All right, I guess you get that point. This is a profound portion of scripture in the Psalms. We would know it probably more from the first way I'm going to read it, but then the message unpacks it in a different way. Psalm 11, verse 3 and 4 says, If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I'm just going to say, redefining marriage is, to, is destroying the foundation of a society. Okay? You can't do that. That's a sacred item to the Lord. That's a sacred thing. We are created in God's image, male and female. He created them. Right? You can't change the definition. That's what marriage means. That's what the covenant is. Okay? So no law that gets passed is going to change that. Sorry, I don't agree with abortion either. The law that got passed that said that was okay, it's not okay with me. Right? Those 60 plus million babies. And Lisa in the front row here is going to be talking about another partnership our church has with a group called First Choice and their pregnancy centers. They, they let pregnant women come in and get, a, what's the machine called again? I'm sorry. An ultrasound. And the statistics are just off the charts that if the pregnant girl is considering whether or not to abort, if they see the ultrasound, change their mind. And if you watch the movie Unplanned, which I highly recommend you do, you will get a whole other level of conviction about the church's role of just passively watching as all this stuff is happening and not doing anything about it. And the reason the girl in Unplanned got saved is because a Christian was on the other side of the fence and built a relationship with her and loved her in the midst of it. Instead of telling her she was going to burn and die, she found out her name. She asked her questions. They were both pregnant at the same time. And this girl that worked there just got convicted that, wow, this seems like such a contradiction. And, you know, the, the lady that plays the boss in the movie does a really good job of making you hate her. <laughs> That's a good actress, you know. Like, we're not supposed to hate anybody, but like, she takes the role really seriously. And uh, this is what I'm talking about. See, when the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then David says, this is what we do. You remember that the Lord is still in his holy temple, all right? We don't get shaken from that foundation. God is still in control, all right? And it could all be raging around us. That's not going to move us. In fact, you will shine brighter if the darker it gets in the culture, the Christians are going to shine brighter. So it's going to be easier to bring the truth when there's so much confusion but be grounded in love, right? We stand firm on that love, that we look at that other person and we're not wrestling against them. It's the principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that are controlling them. So we pray for them. And we say, Lord, what's the combination to the lock of this person's heart? How do, I, how do you want me to approach them differently than anyone else I would ever approach? Because they're different than any other person I'd ever approach. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Just confused about this particular thing that we're talking about. And if there was ever a time people are confused and have thousands of other worldviews that they can tap into, it's right now. Amen. But you're carrying a supercomputer in your pocket. Yes, it could be used for, for evil, but it can also be used for amazing amount of good. Use it for the good. Use it to forward people videos. Use it to forward anointed messages. Use it to... to to help people learn the Bible in a way that's along the way. Ten-minute videos, not hard to watch when you're in your car. Well, you don't watch it in your car, you listen. 
You listen in your car. I'm going to have the police here coming after me. All right. Pull over if you want to watch it. <laughs> All right. So this is what the message says. It just takes it a little bit longer than what I did in three and four there. I'll go back to verse one. And it's the psalmist, very honestly, Psalm of David, he did this often. He just poured his heart out to God. And he didn't care if he was politically correct in the way he said it. And, and he was talking about how fear was trying to grip him. And, and what was he going to do? How was he going to counter that fear? He said, I've already run for dear life straight to the arms of God. <laughs> I love that. So why would I run away now when you're telling me to run to the mountains? Remember that in Nehemiah when the enemies came and they tried to scare him and said, come and, come and hide in the temple. He said, who do you think you're talking to? Would a man such as me run and hide in the temple? You think I would have left the palace and come here and back down to some threat from the enemy? I serve a greater God. I'm not going to run and hide from anybody. I'm on the winning side. I don't go run and hide, but it's tempting sometimes, right? And David's saying rhetorically, why would I run away now when you're telling me to run to the mountains? The evil bows are bent. The wicked arrows are aimed to shoot under cover of darkness at every heart that's open to God. Sound like today? You better believe it. The bottom has dropped out of the country. <laughs> Good people don't have a chance. Run for the hills. No, not running for the hills. God hasn't moved to the mountains. Don't you love that? That's what David says. God hasn't moved to the mountains. His holy address hasn't changed. <laughs> He's in charge as always. His eyes are taking everything in. His eyelids unblinking, examining Adam's unruly brood <laughs> inside and out. Not missing a thing. He tests the good and the bad alike. If anyone cheats, God is outraged. Fail the tests, and you're out. <laughs> now, you can argue with Eugene Peterson whether that's the right way to look at that verse. <laughs> we know that if we fail the test in this dispensation, that there's mercy, that mercy triumphs over judgment. But look, if you believe that your life is a mission for the Lord, I believe it is, then we don't want to fail, right? Like, that's not the idea here. We want to succeed. And when we do fail with another person, if we don't reflect the love of God, if we speak the truth when it's not in love, well, you, you don't really fail with God because he never says, I'm done with you. Failing means you're done, right? No, that's not the case here. But are we learning from it? Or are we just pulling back? And the word passive and Christianity was never supposed to go together. All right? There's nothing that you read in the Bible that would, you would succeed if you were passive. Read the book of Acts. Man. Read the gospel of Mark. Like every chapter, demons are being cast out. People are being healed. Paul's getting, getting riots. Everywhere he goes, there's a riot. When was the last time there was a riot where you were? Because <laughs> you were there. Right? That should bring conviction. I remember being in Covenant Chapel when we first started you know, renting that place. as a, We were a new church, and we were doing an all-night prayer meeting. And it's kind of in a, a, a neighborhood, you know, it's, it's a converted house. So there's all homes around it. And we were doing a 24-hour prayer meeting. And people are bringing drums in and banging drums or blowing shofars. And somebody said, well, what if they call the, what if the neighbors call the cops? And, we you know, we weren't trying to be uh, rude to the, to the people around us. And I said, man, if ever there was something I'd want to be arrested for, it's a 24-hour prayer meeting. <laughs> you know, like, that's exactly what's missing in the culture. So I'm not looking to be a bad neighbor to anybody, but look, if somebody's got a problem with it, this is what we do. I, I, but not, you don't have to be rude about it. But I'm serving God. And I don't have to apologize for that. You know, like the, the, the dollar bill st still says, in God we trust. Last time I checked. Let's pray it stays there. That was 1956. That's when we took on the national motto of America is, in God we trust. You would not know that by the school curriculums that are being passed today. I'll leave that one alone until another day. <laughs> Do you ever think about the comparison of the apostles with Jesus on the boat going to, where were they going, by the way? Anybody here got a Bible trivia question? You want to answer that one? He said, we're going to cross over to the other side. Do you remember what they found when they got to the other side? A demon-possessed man. This is what it sounds like to me. 
I can't wait till these masks are gone. <laughs> Never mind. There was an assignment from the Lord. He, the Lord was up all night. Right? He did this often. He was praying, and the Father would show him what to do. He said, we're going to cross over to the other side. Remember? And then the storm came. Well, wouldn't it be just like the devil to stop them and get them to turn around? Because as soon as they landed, they met a demon-possessed man. Right? And what was Jesus going to do? Say, oh, watch out for that guy. No. He's going to cast out the demon. That's what we're supposed to do. You're in a church that believes in that. But listen, I'm sorry. Again, I'm not trying to compare us to anybody, but there's a lot of churches if you called and said, can I speak to someone in the deliverance ministry, they wouldn't be able to put you in touch with anybody. And not judging, I'm just saying, how did that happen? Like I said, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, 2, 3, I don't know, I can't even count how many people got delivered. So what, the devil doesn't possess people anymore? <laughs> you live in New Jersey and you believe that? Like, what? <laughs> Just drive on Route 3 by Giant Stadium. You'll see a bunch of possessed people. I don't want to make light of it. It's a serious thing. And we have the power. He gave us all authority to tread on serpents. That's what those demons are, right? And I know that's an uncomfortable ministry for people. It could feel a little scary, but one of the things that we're doing is going to go back and start teaching on deliverance again and helping everybody understand that this is the power that God expects us to walk in. That's the church that the gates of hell will not prevail against that's operating in those spirits. Is, is it risky? Yes. I get it. It's risky. What if it doesn't work? That's what our logical brain keeps wanting to think. Well, what if it does work? Look at the difference there. Saying yes to those presents. I didn't know where we were going to bring them, but I knew somebody was going to get them. Right? Like you have to live a little bit on that edge where you're not exactly sure how it's going to work out, but you get the sense of the Lord. He's prompting you that, that he's directing you there. Right? But what about Jonah? He got a directive from the Lord. He was told to get in a ship and go somewhere to fulfill an assignment. And what did he do? Say la. Right? Pause and pray when you hear something like that. Because if you, 50 years from now, you look back on the church in 2020, which of those two would we have been as the church? Well, we have been the one out on the front lines doing the deliverance in the street, crossing through the storm, taking authority over the storm, casting out demons? Or would we have been Jonah hiding in the, what was it called? It says it in here, in the, uh, the bottom of the ship, comfortably, right? It says, God, this is what God said to Jonah in chapter 1, verse 2. Get up and go to that powerful and notorious city of Nineveh. Call out my message against it because the wickedness of its people has come to my attention. In hearing those instructions, Jonah got up and ran the other way towards Tarshish. And he went down to the port at Joppa, found a ship bound for Tarshish, climbed aboard, paid the fare, made himself comfortable in the hold of the ship. Exactly out of God's will. And I'm sorry, it just does feel that way. That for the last 20 years, I've been friends with Lance Wall now. I, I, it's at least that long. And he's been telling churches all over the world that you've got to activate your people in the seats to be ministers in the marketplace. We've got to take all the mountains. There's got to be Christians climbing up in, in the leadership of media and entertainment and the arts and government and teachers, all these different places, Wall Street even. That's a stretch, huh? Yeah. Why? Because when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. It doesn't make us better than them. It just makes us people that have submitted ourselves to God's will and not keep trying to do it ourselves and think we can keep coming up with a better way. You can't. He's got the best way. So Jesus is in the boat with them. He calms the storm. Jonah rejects his assignment and runs from it. And we know what God did, but I think that's a lesson for us today. Whose side am I going to be on? Am I going to be the passive person who watches the culture just go down in the toilet and wring my hands and say there's nothing we can do about it? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Well, rejecting God's assignment is, turning, is, is a wicked way, right? He's not Lord if we're saying no. 
If he's my Lord, that means I submit to him. And I'm saying yes. And look, if that sounds mean, I'm sorry, but didn't you ever have to tell your children to do things they didn't want to do? Talk a little louder at me, please. I hope you don't all leave the church over there. That was because you love them, right? You make a commitment. They tell their friend they're going to be at a party at 3 o'clock on Saturday, and then another better invitation comes. What do you tell them? Stick with the first one. Be a man or woman of your word, right? That's in the Bible. Even if it's to your own hurt, you learn from that. You don't have to say yes the first time they ask. You say, well, I'm not sure yet. I might, might have another obligation. <laughs> but if you said yes, you go, and you'd be happy about it. Be a man and woman of your word. All right, so this is it. I'm going to finish up in Deuteronomy because, wow, it's such a powerful portion of Scripture. And it's, it's similar to a Sermon on the Mount, but an easier assignment. It's not three chapters, but I would really encourage you to read the whole chapter from verse 1 to the end, which is verse 20, I believe. Uh, read the whole thing through because I think it's a lot like what we're doing right now, what we're doing here today, is we're saying, let's take an account of ourselves as the church and decide which do I want to be and which church do I want to be connected to? Would I rather just show up and put my time in and then kind of disconnect from it during the week? Or, or is this something I'm supposed to be transforming into the image of Jesus on a daily basis? Well, you know that we believe that second option and that we're all going to try to help each other do that. And we all do help each other do that, right? There's, there's no rank that says, well, I'm up here and you can't talk to me because you're down there and I'm up here. No, see, this is like what some people say, downward mobility in the kingdom is to be a servant. It's also being a servant. I love sorting out the food at the, at the place that, we, that we're connected with now. It's just, it's not because you, you feel like you're, there's a word in our culture now called virtue signaling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Virtue signaling is when you try to say something to impress other people that you're a very humble person. <laughs> like, Oh, yes, well, I was at the food pantry bagging food. You know, I'm just sacrificing my time for the Lord. You know, Jesus warned us about this. He says, when you fast, don't let everybody know you're doing it. You'll get your reward. They'll know you were doing it, but you're not getting the reward from God when you do that. It's about being a servant when nobody knows. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, right? Because God, who sees in secret, will reward you openly. And it's sometimes better not to say anything. That's the character test that I was talking about. And that's why he's close to those of a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Because if we're really praying and saying, Lord, can you give me the lock to the combination of the heart of the person that you have me working with? What I've been trying isn't working too good. I'm not building a relationship with them. My way isn't working, but I know you have a way that you want me to speak to them so that we, we can gain a relationship. Because people tend not to believe you if they don't feel like they know you. They want to feel like you're being honest with them. And that takes time. You can't rush that. So that's why the Bible-thumping Christian who's talking about if you got hit by a bus tonight on your way home from work, do you know your eternal destiny? That's not building a relationship. And I'm not saying don't witness the people. But look in the Bible how many times Jesus scared somebody into the kingdom versus how many times he loved people into the kingdom. The woman at the well, she's right there behind me, looking over my shoulder. Did he shame her into the kingdom? Could he have? Yeah. Or did he take time and talk to her first and build a relationship and, and have her say, wow, I perceive you are a prophet. <laughs> Maybe I'll listen to you. And that's what happens in relationships. And that gains you currency with that person. And now they're willing to listen to you because you're making more sense than anybody else that's given them advice, right? So here's, here's this conditional promise of the Lord. If, if I had to summarize Deuteronomy 8, it's written by Moses, and it's a warning about missing the blessing of God. And I really think it's a word for church in America as we cross from 2020 into 2021. This is going to be one of those Esther moments. It's for such a time as this church that we are here today. And do you remember what her uncle said to her? Mordecai, remember what he said? Look, you can either do this or not. If you don't do it, God's going to raise somebody else up to do it. But you're going to be destroyed with your family. So 
you can decide what you want to do. And she said, who knows, but I'm not here for such a time as this. Pray for me. And she courageously walked into that king, knowing that she was risking her life. <laughs> One of the things about getting saved out of a really decadent background where I should have been dead, it's like, who am I now to care so much about getting persecuted because every day I have is a free gift from God anyway. I wouldn't probably be here if it wasn't for the Lord. So now I'm going to all of a sudden get all uptight that somebody doesn't like me because I'm trying to tell them the truth. Let's lose that idea. Like, you no, know, do it in love. Speak the truth in love and pray and the Lord will show you. So this is what it says. Deuteronomy 8.20. Remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these how many years? 40 years in the wilderness, right? So he's telling them, you're coming out of one season and you're going into another season now. You wanted to go in the promised land. It took 40 years to get here. Who led you? The Lord. Remember, the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you. Is that a good thing or a bad thing as a Christian to be humble? That's a real good thing. See, he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant, Jesus. Let this mind be in you. Paul says in Philippians, as was in Jesus. He humbled himself and became a servant. That's the lowest rung of the ladder in that culture was to wash somebody's feet when they came to the house. Nobody wanted that job. You think Jesus wanted to leave heaven and come into a sinful planet? Why did he do it? For the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despised the shame. That's who we serve. Remember that. And for me, I told you, 40 years is significant for me this year because it was December 22nd, 1980, the event that happened that caused me to crash emotionally. So it's been 40 years since that event. And, and God is saying, this is for you too, bud. <laughs> he brought you here for a reason. And take it seriously. This is no light thing to the Lord. The church is what the gates of hell will not prevail against. His church. So that's what we want, his church. That he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. Now why would God test you to know what's in your heart? If you're a leader in a church, it's because he loves the people in the church. And if the guy up here doesn't have a pure heart, he could take advantage of a very vulnerable population. Why do you think they do background checks on people who are gonna take care of children? because they're vulnerable and we have to be really careful. Well, so are Christians. We're vulnerable, we're coming out of a broken situation and if you can't trust the motive of the person in the pulpit, you get a Frankenstein, potentially. That's not what God's looking for. He needs people that are humble and fear him first and say, Lord, I wanna take good care of your kids. He humbled you, Peter, testing you to know what was in your heart because if you're going to stand up and talk to his people he's got to trust that you're not going to take advantage of them whether you would keep his commandments or not am i getting this right okay there you go. he humbled me he did let me hunger and fed me with manna which i did not know my fathers did not know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of the lord who said that in the New Testament? Thank you. Quoting Deuteronomy. Verse 11. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God. Could that happen to the church in America in 2021? Well, yeah. Well, I got mine. I'm going to heaven. I'm glad you're going to heaven. But he sure never meant it to be a selfish thing that we hold into ourselves, right? Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I commanded you today. Lest, we really gotta look at this one hard. When you have eaten and are full, America, and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, your silver and your gold is multiplied, all that you have is multiplied because of my blessings on your life and because America was founded on Christian principles and has sent more people on the mission field than any other nation in the history of the world. Don't forget that. That's our heritage. If you listen to God, that sheets, the word God gave him is, I need America. 
to continue to be a mission-sending nation. So maybe it's a test of our metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, the metal. What are we made of, church? Are we gonna fold and run? Or are we gonna take a stand and say, this is what righteousness means? And do it in love. Speak the truth. Do it in love. That's supernatural, if you could pull that one off. Not easy to hate the sin and love the sinner, is it? Help me out here, church. I'll let you go soon. It's not easy, but it's not impossible. Just got to pray. So, boy, be careful. Lest when you're eating on your full and you built good houses and he's multiplied your flocks and multiplied your money and your 401k plan and you have all the security, that then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Jump to 17. Beware lest you say in your heart that my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. And I think that's a word for America. We're getting all the blessings, but we're forgetting how we got the blessings. And if we think we can turn from those blessings now, and we can preach this watered-down version of the gospel because we want to attract more people to pay off the building fund or whatever, that's backwards, folks. That's backwards. My wife and I got saved out of radically bad situations, right? It was miraculous salvation. And a, you know, for both of us, really, but her story is people got saved just seeing the change in her life. We were just talking about it the other day. And, uh, and I just completely stopped doing drugs. It, it was miraculous because I had tried every other way to do it, right? Well, because we were in, in touch with people who were walking with the power of God in their lives. It wasn't a watered-down gospel. I don't know if I would have got saved if I had been introduced into that. I might have. I mean, it's, God can do anything. But, I mean, we're supposed to be people that believe everything that's in this book and that we operate in it, right? So, look, I, I'm not going to say in my heart that it's my power and the might of my hand that has gotten me this wealth. What has gotten me the wealth? Right here, 818. You shall remember the Lord your God. It's He who gives you the power to get wealth. And there's a reason for that, because He knows you want to establish His covenant in the earth. So you get to prosper because God knows that your heart is completely sold out to Him. You remember that verse from the Old Testament? The eyes of the Lord search true and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. Why wouldn't He want to bless you? Maybe for some people that sounds like it's a selfish prayer because you want a bigger house. I know people all around the country because of my work my day job that are Christians that have made God part owner of their businesses. They put percentage, 10, 20, 30 percent of their business in a trust that goes to charity. So all the profits from that part of the business go to fund Christian missions. And they, they give more because their businesses get so blessed. The more they give, the more their business grows. One guy started out with 10 employees. He's got 2,000 employees now. He's given away tens of millions of dollars a year from his business. Talk about a marketplace ministry. It's incredible when you dedicate your life and all that you do to the Lord, how he touches it. Well, it makes perfect sense to me because he knows your heart is right. He can trust you with it. Right. It's he who gives you the power to get wealth that he might confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers. Verse 19. Look, I know this is kind of sobering, but I'm just reading the Bible for you, okay? And we're going into a new year, and I'm just predicting that we're going to be tested. This is not a bad thing, right? You played football. I did. I played football at University of Miami. There was a bunch of serious guys there playing football, man. They had been groomed their whole lives to kill other people like me because <laughs> they wanted to keep their scholarship. And I was a walk-on. And when you showed up at the field, you got tested every day. One of them... You were in the middle, and there was guys circled all around you, and you didn't know which one was going to come at you. You had to hear it, and it was usually somebody behind you. And they had a full head of steam, and you had to just turn and take on the full force. Remember that one, Rich? That was fun, wasn't it? Nothing wrong with being tested. That's what keeps us strong. When you witness to people, you're, remi you're reminding yourself why you believe what you believe. 
And you should be able to give an answer for the reason that you have of your salvation and, and, and why you serve Jesus. Oh, sorry, I got out of it too quick. I guess that's God's way of telling me something here. <laughs> you can still see it, right? Let's test my eyesight here. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after gods and serve them and worship them, I will solemnly warn you today that you shall, I'm going to read it from this side, I'm bailing out here, that you shall surely perish. I just want to be able to stand before the Lord and have him say, well done, now give a faithful servant. You weren't a legalistic Pharisee. You weren't blowing people out and shaming them for not following. But you also weren't this passive person that just said everything's okay in the name of love. You can't do that, church. We have to be in this all in. Like We have to say, I'm giving my life to this because I want to be like you, Lord. You gave your life. I want to be like you. And then he goes on to say, like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you. Now, look, I'm not saying that over America. I'm just saying this is the way it's written in the book of Deuteronomy. It's a conditional promise. We want all the blessings. But if we want the blessings, then we got to remember to serve the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if we see the, if we see the curriculum in kindergarten telling children that they can pick whatever gender they want to have, and you're not outraged by that, something's really wrong, okay? You should be outraged by that. What we do about it is different. That's There's a lot of things that we could do about it. But to do nothing is not a good option. Oh, it's all going to hell anyway. Why bother? Oh, no. Please don't do that. We have to be engaged. And, and you could argue, if you don't like the way the politics are going, it's because the church has been sitting on the sidelines for too long. And I'm not saying get political, but get engaged and pray and understand the things that we're going through. Let's stand, okay? I hope you come back next week. You look like you're all kind of serious right now. <laughs> you know, when, when you got the uh, pep talk at halftime in the game, even if you were winning, the coach would still kind of put the fire in you and say, don't let, don't let your guard down. You know, church, you're winning. You're going to heaven when you die. But don't forget the lost. Don't forget the culture all around you. Don't be intimidated by the wiles of the enemy and the tactics that he uses to make it look like you're the hateful one if you take a stand for righteousness, right? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Do you remember that from Psalm 11? What can we do? We remember that the Lord is still on the throne. So can you lift your hands? Thank you for hanging in here with me today. I'm looking forward to 2021. And I agree with Adriel, there's still plenty of time for God to do miracles in 2020. But Lord, we just commit to you that we will not be part-time Christians, that we will love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that we will make it our goal to be transformed into your image with ever-increasing glory. Each one of us has a, a sphere of influence that the other one doesn't have. And we just say, Lord, that we want to have our ears open, our eyes open, our spirit man teachable to how you want us to live this life in a God-honoring way. That we will speak the truth, but we will do it in love. And that you will use us to impact, like this lady said in this letter today, lives were changed because of the efforts of your church. And Lord, we want to be that church that the gates of hell will not prevail against and take a stand for righteousness with our family, with our culture, with the people around us. Lord, shine your light brightly through your church. You said we would be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And we want to see a great harvest, Lord, that so many of our leaders have talked about a billion soul harvest and the greatest awakening that the world has ever seen. We say, come Lord Jesus and bring the greatest awakening the world has ever seen in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Love you all. We're going to stand at a distance, but if you need prayer, we'll, we'll find a way to get that done, okay, and still keep it legal. But we don't want you to feel like you got to run out of here if you need prayer because plenty of us are still going to be here to stick around and pray. Love you all, and I'll see you next year.